Hey, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas, and you are listening to Light Talk. Good morning. This is Stan in Gainesville, Florida, and today we're discussing internships, backing out of shows, rigging systems, and par gel frames, all on Light Talk. And this is David coming to you from the beautiful Belmont Shore neighborhood of Long Beach, California. And if you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk, and we are the Limit Brothers. Yes, indeed. Well, first of all, welcome everyone to episode 196, and Happy New Year's! <laughs> nah, the heck with this year. Get, get out of here. <laughs> this is our official New Year's show. All I can say is, let's hope that 2021 is nothing like 2020. Go away. Go away, man. Good riddance. <laughs> Too many losses. Too many losses. Hey, are you tired of winning yet? I don't know, man. So, do you guys have any New Year's resolutions? Health. 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 Are you for it or against it? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> no, no. Resolutions. You can't just say health because that's a general wish. I mean, that was that was Christmas. You already gave us our Christmas thing. Resolutions are things that you want to improve on yourself, on yourself. More wealth for everyone. Uh, no, no. It's about you, not for everyone. What's oh. a resolution? I'll, is ta- about- I'll take more wealth. Yes, you know, I'll, okay. I'll get, I want the economy to come back. I want theaters to open. I want I rock and roll too. shows on the road. I yeah, want I'm all gonna, that I stuff. I told you I'm doing two projects that are going to put a lot of people to work. Construction workers, manufacturers. It's going to generate, it's going to bring uh, vitality back to downtowns. That's, what, that's my resolution is to help the economy get back on its feet for all of us who made it through COVID. Okay, but how about something personal? Like, you know, do you smoke and you want to get, you want to stop smoking? Do you want I'm to eat better? I'm an angel. Better? What are you talking about? I, I want more people to smoke because <laughs> I've invested in the cannabis stock. <laughs> so oh, I know. <laughs> Steve's investing in marijuana. You That's know right. something, Steve? You are on the right side. I'm telling you, man. I'm going to buy directly from you. <laughs> do you deliver, by the way? Yeah, Steve, I'll have to give you those stock tickers. I need to need those, those, those three letter stickers for that. I, you know, I think we're, we're, Six months away from the federal government calling in a day and saying it's all right to have recreational and medical cannabis. Oh, yeah, absolutely. What's yours, David? You gave me such a hard time. I've been thinking about it, just trying to be a much better person, I think. You know, are you coming over to the light side? I'm going to go to the gray side. <laughs> I'm gonna, I, 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 I want to go from black to gray. Okay. And then, you know, and I'm going to hang out should be, gray I think for you a while. should become an OLED and really get Ooh, rid of OLED. black. Ooh, OLED. Go totally black. No, OLED no. is totally black. What are yeah, you talking you about? Yeah, you want to get, but the light side, I want you to come over to the light side. Oh, so I'm in OLED. You want me to go into like something that's bright. Yes. We're going to talk about that later in the show, as a matter of fact, <laughs> about the problem with light. <laughs> that's right. Before we get started with our questions, we actually have Letters to Light Talk Central. <laughs> So last week, we had our special Lumen Holiday Extravaganza show. Check it out, episode 195. We had a lot of fun. We brought together just about the whole family for a little lighthearted, frivolous show. Even Stan had some uplifting words to counter my usual dark fatalism. However, it seems that nothing is good enough for some of our listeners, like Mr. Brock Strangelove of Bakersfield, California. He writes, Dear Lumens, On Christmas morning, while my family was opening presents under the tree, sipping eggnog, and enjoying a piece of yummy fruitcake, we decided to listen to your so-called Lumen Holiday Extravaganza show. What I thought would be a cherished holiday moment with the family, enjoying the brothers and sisters wax nostalgia and singing Christmas songs, you know, like Andy Williams and Donny Osmond used to do, we were shocked to hear the Lumens insensitively discussing circumcising squirrels. My children were confused. Imagine the horrified expressions on my little boy's faces when my wife and I had to explain what circumcision meant. A wonderful Christmas moment turned into a perverted nightmare. Is this what you call wholesome holiday entertainment? But the coup de grace was the follow-up discussion on the Light Talk Facebook group where members were joyfully sharing squirrel recipes. How can you even imagine eating the cutest creature that God put on the planet? Finally, I find it outright surprising that you packed your family with three Jews and two Gentiles. Shocking for a Christmas show. QAnon is right. 
You're all a bunch of satanic perverts eating babies and taking over America. Please consider me a former listener of Light Talk. Kiss, kiss, Brock. Wow. I just want to point out that today <laughs> I, I posted a squirrel smoothie recipe. <laughs> wow. You know, oh, we're actually starting a Lumen squirrel recipe book. So, you know, keep those squirrel recipes coming in. And Brock, too bad, man. We're, we're going to miss you. And you don't know what you're missing. So with that out of the way, Steve has our first listener question. I wonder if they eat uncircumcised <laughs> squirrels. Oh, no, you don't. You don't. OK, it has nothing to do with being <laughs> circumcised to be eaten as a squirrel. OK, that was something totally different. So go ahead. <laughs> OK. Russell in Oslo writes, can you explain the difference between an apprentice and an intern position. I'll make it succinct. Typically, an internship provides someone with an overview of the field or the profession. And it's meant to be a short period of time. Also, an internship is kind of a surface level uh, learning. This is not a deep dive into this. Uh, this is for someone who is exploring a variety of interest in maybe a specific field. You know, to give you an example of an internship, uh, if you go to Jacob's Pillow, the kind of uh, uh, center of the planet for dance, at Jacob's Pillow, if you're an intern there, then you and your fellow interns all spend, I think, a week in lighting a week in scenery, a week in costume, a week at the box office, a week in props. So you see how the whole mechanism works. And maybe you've, maybe you start it all over again and pick up another couple of weeks in the areas that you're you know, particularly interested in. An apprenticeship, on the other hand, is meant for someone who has made a career decision. And they're looking for a deep dive, an in-depth experience in a specific field. So an apprenticeship usually consists of a hands-on experience and also classroom education. So, for example, in the late 70s at the Barter Theater, if you were there as an acting apprentice, then you also took a movement class, um, you took acting classes, and you had a, week a weekly Shakespeare reading and discussion class. So, you know, to, you know, to to kind of tie it together, um, internship programs definitely outnumber apprenticeship programs in America. Apprenticeships are longer term. Uh, the pay is better if you're an intern. Apprenticeships give you a hands-on training. There's classroom training or some type of training that is specifically tied to the apprenticeship. And the big thing is that when you leave an apprenticeship, quite often an apprenticeship is your audition, maybe, for a job at that firm or that theater company. So that's kind of the difference between apprenticeships and interns. They serve two completely different purposes. At least in my experience, I've seen a lot of internships being very low paid, if zero paid <laughs> positions. Like I remember when I was a grad student, uh, we had an internship with the Dallas Opera and, uh, and I didn't get paid for that, but I got to experience and watch. It was more like being a shadow uh, for lighting designers. And I got to, you know, uh, deal with that and also cutting gel and things like that, sort of crappy jobs. The apprenticeship for me is someone you're sort of assigned to. You're sort of assigned to a person and uh, that person is sort of your assistant or they're learning the uh, profession through working with you. So I think it's a little closer of a, of, of a relationship. But traditionally speaking, Steve is absolutely right uh, that you have those differences. How about you, Stan? Have you seen any situations like that? Well, I think Steve's description, I was kind of curious how he was going to answer the question. I thought he did a really beautiful job of, of delineating the differences and uh, quite with quite a lot of nuance there. And I was just thinking as I was listening to these both of you guys, great explanations of a little bit of the history too, because I, I, I agree with what was said, but I, I also think that it comes from this old uh, trade guilds mentality from Europe where there were 
there was some you, there was someone who was a, considered a master right. in a particular trade or skill. There was somebody who was considered a journeyman, which is like the mm-hmm. middle ground, and then someone who was the apprentice who was striving to become a journeyman and then a master. And so yeah, it's, I, it's I, like the union. It's sort of like the IA. Well, that's they have right. all those positions. That's right. So I think the apprentice is is the person who is linked up to a master or journeymen who are ahead of them in terms of skills and careers and is then put taking that person under their wing, so to speak. And I think Steve describes the internship quite accurately. And I like to think of our relationship that we have with the Oslo, where we send lighting students down there. I, I like to think of that more as an apprenticeship because they're grad students and they're not really just dabbling. They sort of know what they want. They really want to be exposed to somebody who is a master and the quality and the level of designers who are working at the Oslo are definitely masters. So I, I like to think of it or, or or characterize it as an apprenticeship rather than an internship where an internship is, like Steve said, is a sort of an entry level kind of thing. So I agree with that. I just add that, that, that sort of those three phases of to apprentice, to journeyman, to master. I know that's true in the IBEW, in, in the electricians union. They sort of had those same kind of, and it comes from, I think, that the medieval trade guilds of Europe. That is, a, it's a carryover from that. I looked up the legal definition here, and the legal definition of an intern is that the organization must pay the intern. For private sector employers in the United States, the answer is almost always yes. Generally, the intern will be paid at least minimum wage as well as overtime. There you go. In our situation at the Oslo, they do get food and housing, and we compensate them for travel. But I don't think they're given a stipend of any kind or, or small amount of money. So, so they can't be legally interns then? I guess well, not. if I read the next paragraph, it, it uh, says that roughly 70% of internships are paid as part-time employees, and uh, roughly uh, 30% uh, are unpaid. Oh. But there, there needs to be a tangible um, um, benefit that is going to the intern to make it recognized as an intern I see. position. So, so it could be the experience as the tangible benefit. Sure. I think what's happening is the line in the theater world between interns and apprenticeships is blurring. And so they're trying to make this hybrid, and maybe they should call it something else. I mean, it's why we ha- well, that's why we have a hybrid called Observer, which is definitely non-paid. That's like shadowing. Exactly. So this is actually a good lesson for everyone who's out there looking at art search and looking at all those internship positions, is to make sure you understand how much you're getting paid, or if you're getting paid in some other way, like chickens or squirrels. You never know. Uh, Jennifer in Sweden... Sweden, I love Sweden, writes, can you talk me through installing a new rigging system into a theater and what you would use? Well, that could be a very long talk. Yeah, I'm going to so go I, and get some lunch, so go yeah, ahead go and Go get some lunch. So <laughs> I, I, I won't go into that long of a talk, but I, I, I did make a, some notes, and, and I have four points that we... You know that we would begin with. The first is the program. Like, what are you? What does your theater do? So, what are the operations? What kind of shows do you do? And you determine, you know, basically what the needs of a system are based on programming. So, what kind of stuff happens there? That would be the. So that's point number one. Point number two is what's the budget? That's always going to have an impact on the type of rigging system that you're going to install. If you have a very generous budget or you have a small budget and that you and you kind of think about what types of systems and what can the theater afford uh, relative to what they're doing. The third thing is the staffing. So certain types of rigging systems will require extensive uh, numbers of people to run uh, a fly system. So that, do you have a, a robust staff? Do you job people in? Are there house staff, house carpenters, right? Uh, or is it a one man or a two man operation? So that's going to uh, play a role. And then I think the fourth thing um, is safety. Right. How much is safety a concern? And it depends. Am I going into an existing building or uh, a new building? And and how high does the stage house need to be? And those kinds of questions. And sometimes I can save 10 feet by using automated rigging versus I need 10 more feet if I'm doing manual rigging. And how big is the presidium? So, But safety is a concern. Sometimes in a high school, you might be safer with manual rigging or sometimes you might be safer with automated. 
And so those are the sort of the four big kind of questions that I would grapple with at first uh, that I, before I would get into the nitty gritty about different particular particulars. And I'll just end on this. Philosophically, I'm a fan, of course, if the program demands it, the budget can handle it, the staff are open to it, and safety is always a thing of moving away from manual rigging systems to automated systems because they just reduce the staffing needs. Maybe that's good, maybe that's bad. Um, it improves safety, generally speaking. Um, it will cost a bit more in the short term, but you end up recouping that in terms of the amount of labor needed to run it, and it can handle just about any program. So I'm trying to replace the old manual stuff whenever I have the opportunity to something that is uh, modern and electronic with safety built-ins and reduce the amount of height we have to build on a stage house sometimes or be able to put reasonable rigging into a stage that is not as tall. So there's a lot of factors, uh, but that's sort of my general approach to it right now. I think some of these new uh, automated rigging systems are fabulous. Uh, the ones by ETC. Uh, what's it called, Stan? Well, we, they have a couple because they bought out Vortex and oh, they've got the right. Vortex stuff. And they've also got their Prodigy, which is designed by the Hoffen, the Hoffen brothers, you know. And I love things like, you know, talk about speed. So you can have a, you know, the fastest speed on a Prodigy set is, is uh, three feet per second. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's pretty, pretty fast. damn fast. When we run them at yeah. three feet per second, you can hear the break in wind. Wow. Right? And, and, and then you have these soft landing technologies where they'll just stop beautifully. If they hit something, they have a slack line detector. They, they, they're actually logging every foot they travel so you know when they need maintenance. I mean, the interface on the Prodigy systems are just like an ion. So if you, can, if you can program an ion, you can program. So your cues are just... You know, you're not sending people up to the grid swinging pig iron. I mean, there's just a whole bunch of advantages to that. And I know that people are a little bit leery, but um, we're a fan. Now, in a high school as well. I mean, think about the safety issues. So we've been putting them in high schools for about eight years here in Florida, and we've seen one accident. Uh, and the one accident was a student who wasn't, you still have to use your eyeballs, wasn't looking as they were bringing an electric down and it came down on the top of a piece of scenery. And, and of course, after going, you know, after crashing into it, the slack line detectors detected the slack on the lift lines and stopped it. And there was some damage to the, to the circuit raceway on that electric and it got repaired. But that's one right, accident with no fatalities over, you know, eight years of nine years of operation. And we have it in like four or five, six facilities in the state and we'll be putting in two more. So we're a fan. And, um, you know, I think I think it's a good change. I think it's a modernization and uh, has a lot of advantages. So was that line coming in at three feet a second? And did you hear lots of stagehands breaking wind as it came in? <laughs> I would be breaking wind if I saw that sucker coming in. Yeah, that would be pretty scary. No, I think the, the, the electrics uh, in this particular, the electrics, we never do variable speed. There's really no good reason in a high school to put variable speed on an electric pipe. Uh, and actually, the way the system is designed, I'm glad you asked that, Steve. I can go a little deeper here for those who are interested. To get into the fast mode, you have to enter another password. So, for example, the teacher, most people will operate them for just general usage. You know, you're going to run at a, at a set at a fairly reasonable speed, slow. But when you but you have to unlock to go in to go to the super to the uh, the their maximum speeds. Those of course can be recorded into the cues. So if you're doing nutcracker and you need a quick change and the drop's gotta fly fast, that's gonna be put in the in the queue. So but you know uh, actually I would recommend that anybody who's interested uh, to go down to the ETC showrooms. Uh, we've got one in Orlando where they've got all the motors in place and you can play with them and see how they operate and get, look inside and see. Uh, they've really done a really good job of being really transparent about the technologies. And I think a lot of it comes from the advancements in cargo cranes. Cargo cranes are working all over the world, lifting containers off ships. You rarely hear about accidents. Uh, and they've taken some of that knowledge and applied that to our industry. Well, I mean, I, I, I would argue, too, that uh, an automated system takes hours off of your load in. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I'm surprised more people aren't doing this in black box spaces. Mm -hmm. Get rid of those egg crate grids that take hours to hang and run cable. 
You know, let me say something, Steve, uh, because you mentioned that for Black Box, there are some new products that are just hitting the market uh, from ETC Prodigy are these uh, lightweight uh, pipes for light duty. And now they have ones called Studio Pipe. So, for example, in one facility I'm designing for the box spoon positions, I only, it doesn't need a lot of fixtures. I'll just put these little short, little eight foot, nine foot studio pipes with a, with a weight load that's appropriate. Let me give an example. We did this, the first P75s, which are 75 foot motors that ETC ever sold, we did here in Florida. We were the first to do it. And that theater, they were, they took a risk and there were bumps along the way, but they, and they sometimes hire up to 60 stagehands to bring in shows at that facility. And they run the shows with one person at the controller. And they now are so happy that they have that. And the people that come in, they just love the theater. I was watching a video they made the other day. I didn't know where they talk about it. And they're so proud of it. So I think it's, I think it's the way to go these days. And um, it's just... Uh, I think Clancy has systems as well. So there's several manufacturers out there that I don't know about Europe. Do you guys know about any of the good rigging manufacturers in Europe who are doing the automated stuff? All I know is that every theater that I work in Europe has automated rigging systems. And I'm trying to get rid of tie line. I mean, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> there's a well, segue. <laughs> so when we get the wireless electricity, you will no, have anything to tie the plastic. up. Yeah, yeah go, go to the Netherlands. I mean, all of their soft goods are on uh, large uh, carabiner-like things. They have three pieces of tie line on it, one for center and one for each end. So it takes about 10 seconds to hang a leg. Borders are the same way. If you look at those, it looks like a flatworm. It's a little piece of uh, rubber band that they use to wrap around bundles of flowers. Everything is so fast. The mundane things you know, that, tie, that slow you down is tie line. I mean, how many times do you go somewhere and they got to retie something because someone didn't quite... Right. Start it right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, I'm just amazed at how fast I can bring a show into a theater in anywhere in uh, the Netherlands. Well, yeah, the automated rigging, it's just a beautiful thing. Brian in Ohio writes, when can you back out of a contracted show for a better show that comes along? Oh. Anytime. You just may not want to. Beware. <laughs> You know, the alarms going off, red flags, fireworks. Proceed with caution. This happened to me once. Actually, it happened to me three times. And the first time, I actually backed out of the contract. And the other two times, I didn't. Now, let me tell you, this does happen because we get booked up. And uh, a lot of times, you'll book yourself into a show that, you know, it may not be the show that you really wanted to do, but it's a job and you need to earn a living. And so you take the show, right? And actually, maybe it's actually going to be an interesting show. You never know. But you're booked in that show for about a year in advance. And um, you signed a contract. And then all of a sudden, this other opportunity comes up at a much larger theater. Maybe it's a brand new production somewhere. Maybe it's a pre-Broadway show. Maybe it's a huge opera in Europe that's probably going to have legs. And then you're going to have to make a decision. Because if you back out of a show, especially if it's at the last minute, you are pretty much going to blackball yourself for working in that theater again. However, if you go to the producer or artistic director, or first of all, go to the director and tell this director, well, I just got this opportunity. What do you think? Because uh, so, you don't want to burn your bridge with the director ever. Then the director, you know, if it's, if it's a no brainer, like you got a show at the Met, right? Or you got a Broadway show. Of course, they're going to understand and what you do is you explain the situation and you already have people lined up to take your place in case they're interested. And, you know, and, and talk to the director about it. See if the director wants to work with these other lighting designers or set designers or whatever. Very, very important. But it's not always black and white like that. Uh, I have turned down shows that would have made me a lot of money because the show that I was contracted to was someone who I was very loyal to. 
And I don't think you could put a price on loyalty. I think loyalty is the most important thing that you can have in this business because we these are relationships. And I'm talking about directors more than anyone else. And it could be an artistic director too. And I can think of two cases where I gave up a show in a much larger venue that toured and I would have made close to $100,000 had I taken that show. And I turned it down because I was loyal to the original person. And I don't regret it. I really don't. Because when I look at this person every time, I, I just understand why I did it. Because they're just such great people. So I don't know. What do you guys think? What does the union say about it? What, what is the legality here? Is there a timetable? Well, the, there's no timetable, really. I mean, if you, it's a contract. You are contracted to do that show, but both parties can agree to let you out of the contract. And this happens, you know, with not only designers, it happens with singers a lot and actors, too. If a, you know, if a big TV show comes up and an actor's in a regional theater play, <laughs> they're going to dump that play so fast. And usually the producer understands and, and they're going to let him go because they understand that they want it. And, I, and to tell you the truth, had I talked to this artistic director and explained the situation, he would have let me go do it. But I would not put him in that position. I just didn't want to do that. I just think he just it's a call that you have to make yourself. But be careful. Handle with care. And, uh, and be honest. Always be honest. Well, I have a joke answer and a serious answer. So the joke answer, I just hire somebody else to do the other project. But maybe you can't do that. Well, and have a, someone else show up at rehearsals and they don't know who they yeah, are. Well, I'm just thinking if, the, if I, you know, it depends on the kind of, if it's, a, if it's a lighting design job, I guess not. I've seen that happen at regional theaters. Yeah, you're sitting there and all of a sudden uh, the incredibly famous multi-Tony award-winning designer is not there. Because he, he, he or she just has another amazing Broadway show that's opening and the associate is there. Yep. Let me tell you something. It's never a good situation. You are listening to Light Talk. And today, Light Talk is sponsored by Sambersky Labs. Did your lighting company invent the first lighting control console that can read your mind? How about... The first LED spotlight that not only auto-focuses to voice command, but uses wireless electricity. Or did they invent a new magnet that lifts thousands of pounds above the audience's head without the use of any wires or cables? If your company developed any technologies like this, then you need Sambersky Labs to protect your innovative intellectual property. Sambersky Labs will write the most ironclad non-disclosure agreements you can imagine. With our team of former Soviet security agents, any violation of the NDAs are swiftly met by a well-dressed, discreet, and highly lethal agent. The offending employee who makes the mistake of disclosing your secrets will be quickly plugged into a high-voltage device guaranteed to wipe their memory of any trade secrets, including all memory of their life prior to the illegal disclosure, or we will just lace their undies with poison, or they will wake up with a bear's head in their sheets. Your choice. Contract the services of Sambersky Labs and put an end to those loose lips. Remember our name, Sambersky Labs. Then forget it. Your life could depend on it. And now back to light talk. Well, those crazy ducks tell us that it's time for another installment of Let's Talk About. And today's Let's Talk About is all about, well, <laughs> it's about doing summer theater intense, believe it or not. You know, we got this question from Doug from Cambridge, Mass, our fair city. <laughs> I think many of the first shows that come back after the pandemic will be outdoors. True. How do you write cues for outdoor shows when your ambient light will change so much? In particular, if a show runs outdoors over several weeks in the summer, a cue written for a show in the evening in early July might have a very different lighting environment than the show in early August. So we decided to elevate this question to our Let's Talk About segment because we're all going to have to tackle this challenge, and it is quite complex. Stan, Steve, any ideas? It's not complex, Doug. Have a drink. <laughs> have a you drink. Know, <laughs> calm down. So I don't know about Cambridge, but I looked this up for Dallas, Texas. So if my show opens June 1st uh, of 2021... That means the sunset in Dallas is at 831. 
If my show closes uh, Labor Day weekend, then that means the sunset is at 8 o'clock. So 30 minutes, give or take. I don't know if it's that, that desperate a situation. He specifically asked about that. You're right, Steve. But it is true. A lot of summer shows right now are planning on doing tent shows. They're moving out of the theater because of COVID regulations. People are making alternative plans. And with the current COVID uh, regulations, and they'll probably be the same when June rolls around, to tell you the truth, they're asking for a completely open tents on the sides, that there must be a cross airflow in these tents. So that means there's a lot of light that's coming in. So let's even forget about the 30 minutes that that's, things are going to change. How do you light a show with so much ambient light coming into a tent? Well, I think, I think people who do summer stock theater in an outdoor environment have been doing this for a long time. So I'm not, I'm not convinced that, uh, well, I have to say, I don't know anybody who's come back to the theater two or three times over the course of three or four months um, and relit the last, you know, 30 minutes of their show. Or, or you know, I think it's, I, I think it's a, maybe a problem that's, if you, if you have time to do it, I think it could be a really, I think it could be a really interesting uh, proposition for a university that has um, a, a summer stock theater. I think this could be a really good project uh, for research and just to see what does have to be done. So I see it more as a, a PhD project than a real life application. In the early '90s, I worked at a very large. The second largest outdoor summer theater, I think, in New York, which is up in Albany, New York, called Park Playhouse. And we had a stage out in front of a uh, Olmstead building with a big amphitheater, and we lit stuff. And it opened, uh, it always opened on July 3rd, and the stage faced west. And for the first, th- I would light the shows or tech the shows at night with the lights down, but the first 30 minutes for about the first three or four weeks, was going to there was going to be a lot of direct sunlight coming at that stage from the west uh, lighting it up and so there was more light than you would expect uh, and then and then as the summer progressed it got darker earlier so what i did is i lit the thing uh, the stage manager saw what it looked like in darkness and we sort of uh, discussed it and then we boosted those light levels, uh, just everything to full when the sun was up. And then as the, the uh, summer progressed, we, the stage manager was given license to just pull out that light back down to the recorded levels, which we did when there was no sun at all. And it worked out just fine. Back then, of course, it, it would have been really complex to do a sun study of that space it, with the right GPS and see what the sun was going to be doing and get a sense of it. And now almost every software out there, all the software I use, all, use from WYSIWYG to Vectorworks to Lumion, they all let you place your venue right on the GPS coordinates, set the time of day and what the, if the sun is, if the sky is overcast or cloudy, and you'll see exactly what you're going to have. So you can sort of get a sense of what that is. Of course, we didn't have that then no. in software. We'd, had a, you'd have to do it, take a model and use a, use a sundial and figure out what's going on. So I think, I don't think it's difficult to overcome. And I do agree with Steve. It's a wonderful project uh, as a study uh, for a student, for sure. We do sun studies in my program and it's pretty cool. Well, universities might have the money to invest in the software if they haven't already. They're not as um, worried about budget in regards to labor because they're using students. I, I, I think this is a summer project for somebody. I like this idea a lot that Doug has come up with. How do you do it? Let's, let's test it out and see. When you go into situations like that, you actually need to encompass and use what nature has to offer you. Uh, as a set designer, you do the same thing. And, and if you're doing a set at Santa Fe, you know, you've got that beautiful vista in the back. You know, I've seen sets that completely cover it up, but not many. <laughs> Most people use that. Because that's part of the experience of doing outdoor theater. But yeah, it is it is a challenge. And the one thing that I really have to say about lighting outdoors is that if, if you're going to have daylight, you need a lot of power to overcome that. Because it's all about lumens. It's really all about contrast. 
so that the people are focused in onto the stage. And then as it gets darker, you go ahead and you adjust and you bring that intensity down. But I think Stan said it right. He said, had everything at full and then it comes down. Uh, nowadays, you know, we do have powerful enough fixtures that will give you actually a sense of the color or of the stroke of light. But again, you can't, you can't battle it. It's nature and it's going to be sunlight. So you got to figure out how to do it. Now, it's not just companies that are used to doing outdoor theaters. There's, these are companies that are used to doing indoor theater, and now they're moving outside, right? So designers need to be really, really knowledgeable and vocal and interactive about how they approach the show. And it's a more design aesthetic thing than thinking that it's going to look like it would look if you're in a black theater. Well, the problem you get into is... People who, I mean, I, 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 I did the second show at an outdoor theater some years ago, as opposed to the first show. And I was there to see the first show. And they said, uh, we always like to start tech at midnight. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, yeah, why, are you tech? <laughs> why are you starting tech? Why are you starting? Well, but, but if you have a design team who understands what they're doing, right. we go back to Stan's point about the lights are more or less at full, the contrast. I remember going to see the show that they started their tech at midnight at the sun was probably a good four fingers up in the air. Mm -hmm. And it opened up with a single red park can on from behind and six Vera lights they had turned into helicopter blade effect. And they'd spent hours on this and they'd rented. <laughs> I'm glad they rented the lights because they didn't work for crap in that show. But they, they worked great in my show. And I thought, OK, here we sit. And I remember the director turning to the stage manager going, where's the effect? Where's the effect? Well, if you start tech at midnight and you start all of your dress rehearsals at 9 o'clock, it's a very different show. And I'm sure it was quite stunning when they did it. But, I mean, all that time is wasted if you don't understand, if you and the director don't understand what you're up against. I just wanted to add to David's point about the uh, lumens. Yeah, I had, on that story I told, I had two front towers with a, a 48,000 watts of park in on it, you know, 24,000 watts on each. So I had, I had plenty of blasting front light. And the other thing uh, about the software for doing sun studies, that stuff is free. I can give a whole list of, of programs that will do sun studies for you. Don't won't cost you a nickel. Great. We could post that on the Light Talk Facebook group page. <laughs> I'll be happy to. So Steve has our last question. Yes, it is Ben in West Virginia. And Ben writes... Why are par gel frames hexagonal? Um, well, let, let me say, somewhere in this great land of ours, I'm sure there's a six-sided par gel frame. I personally have never seen one. What I have seen are octagonal gel frames, and they came from um, James Thomas. And their eight-sided frame, I think was um, they legitimized this in three ways. First, cost. It was simply cheaper and you used less material to make an eight-sided frame. Uh, second, it was weight. And it doesn't seem like a lot, but if you think back, someone, I've forgotten who it is on uh, Facebook right now, is posting the kind of par can glory days. <laughs> and when you were seeing six or seven or 800 par cans in the air, <laughs> That's right. every little ounce made a difference. <laughs> but really, I think uh, when I talked to the James Thomas people about this back in the early 80s, what they said was they made a, um, a pre-rigged truss and it had two par bars in it. Each par bar, uh, each par bar had six lights on it. They dropped out and you could focus them. If you put a standard uh, four-sided par frame in there, it collided with the frame next to it. So you didn't have a range of motion on the par can. But if they clipped the corners and made it into an eight-sided frame, that extra couple of inches that it could pivot made a huge difference in the focus. So they said focus uh, because the lights were so tightly packed 
in that par bar. That makes a lot of sense. I never, I didn't know that. That's really actually makes a lot of sense. Makes sense. Can I add something to Steve's point about the weight? This is a strange piece of trivia, but if you drink Coca Cola out of a can, <laughs> you, you will remember <laughs> that the cans used to have a straight at the top, top and bottom. They had a, like a rim, right? Right, and now they don't. Right. They're rounded. Right. And why? For, back to Steve's point, they saved millions of dollars <laughs> by redesigning the Coke can because it, each one uses just that much less aluminum. Crazy but true. There you go. <laughs> Crazy well, but well, truth. Well, well, Ben, on that note, let me say that if you are a Coca-Cola drinker, and you drink out of a can, for God's <laughs> sakes, use a straw. Yes. Do, do not. I, oh, absolutely. You have no idea where that, where that can has been, how many rats, how many dogs have peed on yeah, it. I've seen roaches. <laughs> oh, nasty. You can I wash op- it. I opened, when I first came to New York, I opened a can of Coke in a, like a little you know, store there and took a drink out of it. And my God. I had like eight people running to me with straws in their hands going, what are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> Especially a now in with the pandemic. Don't go near Coke cans. Well, the rocking sounds of Illuminoids tells us that once again, you spent another morning listening to Light Talk. You can hear our show on Spotify, iTunes, Google, YouTube, LiveDesignOnline.com, and just about every podcast site out there. Check out our website on LightTalk.org for future guests. And be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our podcast. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk Insanity. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. However, if you decide to litigate us, the law firm of Flecht, Flux, Flair, and Glare, and their paralegal snoot will defend us until our retirement funds are depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers, coming to you from Long Beach, Gainesville, and from deep in the heart of Texas. And be sure to join us next week when we welcome themed entertainment designers Paula Dinkle, Jen Goldstein, Brian Gale, and Patrick Gallagos to Light Talk. Light Talk, broadcasting questionable Lumen knowledge and humor around the world. So we'll see you all next Saturday morning. Bye-bye from Light Talk. And Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year.